I talked to a friend yesterday, and I mentioned the title, and they said, oh, that's a terrible, terrible title, Implications of Geopolitics and Energy Transition for Resource Juniors. It sounds like a policy wonk type of a, type of a title. So I added the little parenthesis. It's, it's really all about buy now and don't look back. This is the portrait of the misery, the 10-year bear market that we've had. The blue is the trading value of the TSX Venture Resource listings, and the yellow and the red represent relative share of traded value, and the red is basically cannabis, crypto, everything, dominating the space for the last 10 years, marginalizing the resource juniors. But take a look at what happened at the start of last year. This has ended. The non-resource stories are dead for now, and I don't think crypto and cannabis can make a comeback. It's got to be something new and different that takes away the, uh, the risk capital. This is not much of a January effect, but it has been very promising what we've seen. Now, this is a history of financing activity by TSX Venture Resource Listings. The red is the private placement mechanism. And uh, you can see there was a pretty good financing window here from 2020 on, even though we didn't really get rewarded in the stock market in the same manner. But there's a new development that everybody should be aware of. It was made official on, in November. It's the listed issuer financing exemption. They have finally gotten rid of the uh, accredited investor requirement to participate in a private placement. You no longer need to be a millionaire or somehow involved in the brokerage industry to participate. Brokerage firms are starting to do them. Several juniors are experimenting doing them as non-brokered. It's gonna be a lot of paperwork, but this now opens up the financing to the entire Canadian audience, uh, no matter what age and wealth that you have. So this, is, this is, breathes new life into the resource junior by expanding the capital pool massively. It'll take a while to work out the kinks, but this is really promising. So there's two key drivers. One is the energy transition, and the other is the geopolitics, uh, the, the autocracy democracy showdown that's playing out right now, that's splitting the world uh, away from this idea of a globalized economy, everybody trading uh, the lowest cost jurisdiction, winning the day. Now we're seeing it split into a China-Russia alliance and uh, other autocracies are thinking, well, we better be with them because the United States is uh, uh, using sanctions and it's US dollar to uh, limit what we can do. And of course, the uh, Russia's invasion of Ukraine, that's something that's irreversible. R Russia has no way, no way out. And uh, I think that there's, there's three outcomes. One is what we have now, which is the world splitting ever more into two distinct economic zones. And that has very important implications for the resource juniors. The second outcome is, is the craziest outcome, which is that United States itself becomes an autocracy and the alliances with all the other companies dissolve and it's all like everybody against everybody. And if America becomes an autocracy, that also will result probably in the breakup of the country into separate nations and civil war. And that's, of course, a, a good argument for gold, but it's a scenario we really don't want to see unfold. The third scenario is that coups oust uh, Xi Jinping, Vladimir Putin, and are not replaced with another strong man, but a new regime that slowly goes back to uh, globalization. That's not particularly good for, for gold. It is good for the energy transition. Now, the energy transition itself is now happening. It's no longer just policy-driven, and the car makers are the key drivers of it right now. They've gone the point beyond the point of no return, and the metal, new metal supply required to make this happen, it is very substantial. And the fragmenting of the world into these two different zones, that complicates the ability of achieving the energy transition. So there was a document that came out uh, this month, earlier this month, uh, by the International uh, Energy Agency. It's 458 pages, 48 megabytes. 
it is really worth reading. To, it's a blueprint of how the energy transition is supposed to work. And I've clipped a bunch of, uh, of their graphics just to illustrate why I think the foundation has been laid for a very powerful resource junior bull market. Now, there's two parts of it. They have the 2050 goal of zero emissions uh, and limiting uh, the uh, uh, temperature gain to one and a half degrees Celsius above pre-industrial periods. And uh, that's the overall long-term gain. But the short-term goal, 2030, that's basically uh, based on electric vehicles becoming dominant and replacing internal combustion engines. What comes afterwards is quite interesting. It's uh, continuing to see the solar wind power build out and then the surplus energy harness to make uh, hydrogen uh, through electrolysis of the surplus energy and then either burning that to feed electricity back into the grid or piping it for the hydrogen fuel cells that will power heavy duty transport trucks for which the lithium ion battery just isn't good enough to uh, make uh, you know, big trucks and things like that uh, 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 useful to be uh, an electric. So this, uh, this, this is the uh, sweet spot for the resource juniors right now. This here breaks it down in the uh, sort of five metal groups that uh, they have identified as critical minerals. And uh, you can see the impact lithium this, is, this graph here shows how much uh, more in percent terms is required to make that 2030 goal a reality. You can see this in copper and nickel and cobalt and, and in the rare earths. They've used neodymium for all the four, four rare, earth, uh, rare earth magnets. And that's mainly for electricity networks, the motors and the batteries and electric vehicles. Now, this is a fascinating, fascinating graphic. Uh, they've identified how much uh, uh, capital is already committed to make these portions of what they see as happening. The stripe portions are what's not yet identified. And what I find interesting is how little of the uh, committed or expected investment is for North America. And this is what they call other Asia Pacific, that's Australia in places like Indonesia and the Philippines uh, for, for metals like nickel. So right now it's North America, which is our focus, our resource juniors are you know, mainly North America. This is like not being taken seriously as a source. It's going to end up taking care of, North America is going to be taking up a good part of this, maybe some of this, and I think this half that's missing from the, uh, the future lithium requirement. Now, one of the things that I found really fascinating about this document was that they have acknowledged that the mineral supply is the biggest obstacle to the energy transition becoming reality. They've identified how much more capital, total capital is needed to make this stuff available. And they've also identified the decision timeline. Now, the reason I use this line of the next three years they have to figure it out in the next three years where all this extra copper, nickel, and lithium, and even rare earths are supposed to come from so that the permitting and that can, uh, can start to unfold and have this stuff ready by 2030 and then grow beyond that. And they have identified, they go repeated over and over again about these hideous timelines. And I think the big thing that's starting to circulate at high levels is our policy goals are meaningless unless we shorten the permitting timeline. Don't cut corners or anything, but stop using the permitting cycle as a Western form of graft where instead of paying off a dictator to make it happen, we end up wasting all this money pretending to be permitting a project and going through these endless studies. Let's make it efficient. And then when we identify the, the costs and benefits, make hard decisions. Maybe that buckwheat plant there at Rhyolite Ridge just needs to be not part of the diverse uh, ecosystem anymore because there are bigger things at stake and that is the uh, impact of climate change if nothing's done, uh, done about global warming to uh, uh, prevent the, all the, you know, the, the, the rising sea levels and all that to uh, mess things up. 
So this simplifies uh, what is needed more of. Now, now, copper has a huge base, and it tracks the macro economy. But they're still expecting that just adding the electric vehicles will require a 50% expansion of supply just to accommodate that need. Nickel, it's 100%. Cobalt, it's 50%. And, and, and neodymium or the whole rare magnet, rare earths, it's, it's a doubling. But it's the lithium, and, and I've been talking about you know, needing 10 times as much by uh, 2035. Uh, They're talking we need six times as much as we have now by 2030. So here's, you can see, the only metal that did super well last year was lithium carbonate. And this was Lithium Mania 1.0 when the Tesla started being built and uh, the Australians recognized and we had a good price. But the Australians were hyper efficient at mobilizing lithium from pegmatite deposits. So they overwhelmed the market, caused this crash below $3 per pound where no pegmatite deposit works. But meanwhile, the car makers kept chugging along and all the others joined Tesla and they all Make, making huge investments uh, in battery factories and so on to the point where they can't, can't turn back. And in 2021, the market started to turn around and last year it has been up here. Now we've seen this before with vanadium and other metals and cobalt, you know, it takes off, everybody gets excited. And so the attitude here is yes, this will come crashing down. Yeah, it has to, it has to crash down into this 10 to $15 a pound range. At that level, the good pegmatites all work, and the world will have enough supply from all these pegmatites out there. So instead of going, oh, carbonate's dropping, it's down to $20 a pound, bubbles over, let's stop uh, chasing these lithium companies. No, this actually has to happen. Uh, there's a bit of a slowdown expected this year in, in China, but uh, 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 structurally, some are predicting that we're going to see these stupidly high prices uh, for some time yet. So either way, whether it retreats is a good thing because that means the cars will be more affordable down the road. Or if it stays up there, everybody will get super lathered up about lithium and think it's gonna be there forever. And that will definitely uh, provide the optics to pull more money into the space. And again, this is, this is so staggering. Um, you know, two, $200 million worth of this stuff was sold and. 2005, mainly for the glassware and ceramics industry. And then you have the, the sort of the digital phone cell batteries and that coming in. And then this is, this is the car sector coming in and it's just barely getting started. That's in 2021, that 100,000 tons at the average price of $15, that was $18 billion. Now I've created this graphic, which is really hard to kind of understand. But the point I want to make is when gold suddenly went from 35 bucks to 800 back to 400, uh, it achieved a new level of you know, production, but the value of gold supply remained static for over 20, 25 years. We're seeing compressed, this growth from here in the next eight years, we're going to see this be a hundred billion dollar plus market. The idea that some obscure metal could become a 100 to 200 billion dollar market within 10 years being the same league as copper and gold that is unheard of and there's a lot of skeptics saying it's not possible given the permitting timelines and and obstacles but again my point is there's this policy driven urgency to this that's overarching and you can either give it up and just uh, figure out like abandon florida and move to places that won't be flooded or you can dig in and make this happen. And here's sort of where the pegmatite uh, places are in the world. Most of it comes now from here and in the brines from the, the Chilean uh, uh, lithium triangle. China's trying to produce a bunch from its uh, inferior deposits, but it's these parts of the world there and there, and even, even here, this is all messed up with uh, 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 um, jihadi type, uh, type of politics. But this, especially the Canadian part, which doesn't have as horrible a NIMBY problem as the United States, this is where the other half of the required lithium supply is going to come from. And this is what I call lithium mania 2.0. And here's sort of four examples of, you know, 
why it's happening. This is Patriot, which kicked it off last year with its Corvette project. They had it in, 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 in 2015. In um, 2018, I had them at MIFF as sort of a, a mithril copper tie-on. The, at the time, uh, uh, lithium was at three bucks a pound, and, and that stuff was worthless. But since then, they've reorganized, and they've discovered this is like a 50 million ton system of one to 2% lithium oxide. We're talking, you know, you know at the current price, you know, three to thousand to six thousand dollar rock that's open pitable. So you got to divide that by three to get back to, to reason. But we're still talking about, you know, something in gold. You, you can't find an open pitable uh, deposit that's got thousand dollar rock. Now, admittedly, lithium has higher processing costs than, than gold does. But it's still, this is like a, um, the, the value component is fantastic. Oh, oh, my, I wasn't going to finish there. So then this is the one, I mean, Bob Wares, he was sort of a founder of a Cisco, and he started scratching his head early last year at this lithium thing and said, ah, this is so good, I must have missed the boat. And he started checking and realized, no, everybody has been asleep at the switch. So Brunswick has been on a staking and optioning rampage going through the archives because all these pegmatites were found ages ago as a byproduct of exploring for gold and, 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 and precious metals in, the, in these greenstone, Archean greenstone, greenstone belts. And because they were worthless, green bushes and the lithium triangle supplied whatever the world needed, they were just noted and discarded. So there's now a huge cross Canada scramble to acquire these and start rethinking these in terms of demand going up sixfold over the next decade and supporting a minimum $10 a pound price. And then, oops. And then this one, Azimut, was here this yesterday morning. The, it, it, the stock doubled in price this last week after it mentioned that it has all these properties at stake for non-lithium reasons that are actually potentially lithium pegmatite bearing. And yet, uh, the, in, in the presentation, it was all about the gold project still. This market is still waking up. And this is like the little tiny sleeper that I have been accumulating as a bottom fish. And you can see even that is waking up. They have been a stealth staker of land in the James Bay area, which seems to be useless for gold and base metal deposits, but appears to have world-class lithium pegmatite potential. And they're using sophisticated stuff like the rubidium in the lake bottom sediment databases and their knowledge of glacial history that came from the decade when they toiled trying to find another Renard and sort of reconstructing why is this rubidium here in these lakes? Where's the history? Where's the blank spots where there seems to be nothing that's actually the origin of this stuff? So this little company is going to come out of the woodwork uh, sometime in the next few months. And the reason I'm probably one of the only newsletter writers uh, who's really pumping this whole awakening that's happening is because I lived through the uh, 1990s diamond boom. And prior to 1991, nobody knew anything about diamonds. So I lived and breathed this whole eruption of diamet with the caddy, the looking for diamonds uh, beyond it. And so I say we're like still really early in the stage. It's like almost one year since Diamet first announced it, and we're in this point. And there's going to be an explosion later this year where everybody is going to be into lithium. And the cannabis promoters and crypto promoters, they're already grabbing shells. They're out there staking land. Amateurs are starting to stake the worthless land between the uh, pegmatite belts. This is going to be crazy. But lithium's not the same as diamonds. The little Kimberlite clusters can come up anywhere within a broad expanse. You do have to have the right geology to have a pegmatite. So this lithium focus, it, and, and it's the, all little horrible companies with too much paper out and all that, which are getting this. So this is back to our, the dream world from a couple decades ago when five 10 cent companies can end up a buck, two bucks, even five dollars. We haven't experienced this sort of scale of an area play, which is also a concept play since the diamond days uh, 30, 30 years ago. And here's sort of the you know, a, a, a perspective of where this all, these, these critical metals are supposed to come from. Coppers comes from everywhere. 
it doesn't have that uh, security of supply problem. Um, lithium doesn't either, and Canada is probably one of the most secure jurisdiction to find more of it. These two do. Look where, look where all the nickel comes from. Over half the nickel, this part, if China decides to become very aggressive and uh, split between uh, the autocratic and democratic uh, uh, groups uh, uh, accelerate, such as China uh, uh, annexing Taiwan and the United States uh, refusing to just roll over and say, okay, whatever. And also, all these rumors, they still come mainly from China. And these aren't part of the battery, but they're part of the motors. They're critical. So there's another rare earth mania 2.0 coming, but it won't come until the relationship with China breaks down totally. And we hope it doesn't, because if it does, we have all kinds of horrible problems. Now, with regard to this uh, sort of showdown between democracy and autocracy, this graphic should frighten everybody because this shows the percent of the, all the uh, metals that come from China and Russia combined. I mean, 19 of them, more than 40%, comes from these two countries. This is a horrifying chart. And this is what comes from America with the same scale on the side. America has a problem if this autocracy, democracy showdown accelerates into a complete split into separate trading zones. So this is a really interesting, so you look at where all the GDP is, and I circled the ones that are gonna be part of the autocracy alliance, and uh, let's see which one's which, okay, China. This is interesting. This is the IMF still projecting five, six percent growth. China, has probably peaked. Uh, it was 3% last year. Now the zero COVID policy was responsible for China's growth slowing down. They capitulated at the end of last year. Right now the Lunar, Lunar New Year is like spreading it over the entire country. Uh, hospitals have been forbidden to write down COVID as the reason for death. Um, last year the population actually went down. The, in demographics, China has peaked. Now, a lot of the bullishness in the market right now is premised on the idea that China is going to reopen and get things going. But I think it's, uh, it, it's peaked. Yes, it's going to get back going again, but the China super cycle is over. Russia, of course, is, is a nothing burger. It's like way over here in terms of global GDP. Its growth is expected to be negligible. But this is the star. Now, 12 years ago, we said, yeah, India next super cycle, but it was way too soon. But it's, we're now at a point where it's time to start taking the possibility of India launching the next super cycle seriously. And right now, India's undecided whom it's gonna ally with, the autocracy side or the democracy side. And so there's a lot of behind the scenes work to make sure that India decides to stay a democracy and people are now moving up. Companies are moving manufacturing capacity to India. India is embracing electric vehicles. It wants to be part of this solution. And uh, there you can see it. And China hit the tipping point right around uh, here in 2002 when it got to about 3.9%. I think India's growth will probably be better by 2030. India is going to be ready for liftoff. And in terms of the whole military stuff, uh, this is just a chart I threw in it to show how Russia, without its uh, nuclear destruction capacity, is not a big deal in terms of, of military capacity. So how this Ukraine thing plays out, I do not know. I wish he would just suddenly decide to retire to his Dasha and uh, somebody else come in and restore Russia as a great nation and raw material supplier. But really, in a, in a military encounter, uh, Russia can't win. And here's, now this scale is only 10%. Here's India's self-sufficiency in raw materials. It's quite terrible. So India is going to be this big pulling in of raw materials elsewhere when they start going through their expansion. And why should India you know, go through this expansion? Well, because it's going to have the most people in the world. And uh, now it does have all the limitations of a democracy and not getting stuff done, unlike a top-down command dictatorship. Uh, we'll see if they can back me overcome, but 
India is a potential huge drawer of resources from elsewhere. And now to the goal part. Now, if I'm right about this uh, split between autocracy and democracy hardening rather than dissolving back into normal relationships, we're going to see demand for gold uh, continue to go up. And this has been pointed out by others. The, 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 the GLD stuff that ordinary Western investors buy, it's been just noisy. This trend is really about the central banks shifting to buying this and not so much the democracy central banks, it's the autocratic ones who realize that the US has weaponized the dollar and is using the settlement system to create sanctions and hamper trade. So there's this massive movement to literally diversify away from the use of the US dollar. And nobody really wants a, a RMB or a, a ruble. Uh, they want the, uh, uh, so, so the transition is going to be, the bridge is going to be gold. Gold's going to play a role in this. And uh, you can see the US dollar has already peaked. So we probably, that will also help with the gold trend as the US dollar reverses from its uh, long run upwards. And this shows you the trend in the last decade for central bank total holdings as a relative portion that's been flat. And this shows you that there has been consistent central bank accumulation during this past period. I don't have the data from 2022, but it's been perked even higher this year. But this is the elephant in the room. China's the world's biggest gold producer. And during this last 20 years, they've produced, uh, was it about 243 million ounces or 230 million ounces? They account, their official holdings account for only a portion of that. 180 million ounces went somewhere. So did they blow it out into the open market and people in Switzerland and Singapore or whatever own it? Did the Chinese themselves buy all this gold? I have a suspicion these various state owned entities have accumulated gold on the sly and that China's gold holdings are now possibly on a par with those of the United States. Now if that ever came out, I think that would create shockwaves in terms of uh, respect for the role that gold's gonna play. And you know, for people to talk about gold as an inflation hedge, yeah, it's done that. When you take $400 gold from 1980 and adjust it by the annual average CPI, it should be about here, and all in sustaining costs are, are here now on average. So it's this real price gain that's important. So having gold go to four or $5,000 because something terrible has happened, that's not helpful, but seeing it repriced in real terms as a result of a whole different buyer accumulating the new supply that keeps coming from the mining industry and tucking it away for a, a world that's bipolar, that's no longer a unipolar run by the United States, uh, that's going to be a continual pressure. So we're gonna have the search for these critical minerals, uh, both to meet the absolute new demand globally that's required, but also potentially dealing with supply not being available from the jurisdictions that we relied on in the past because they are now in an autocratic uh, uh, trade, trading zone. And we're going to see a revival of interest in gold exploration because you can't find a gold deposit big enough whose supply can tank the price of the metal. The metal of the gold market is super deep. 